happy to be with you all. As Jennifer mentioned, I'm a health scientist with the CDC's Climate Health Program. I'm also an author on the Fifth National Climate Assessment Southeast chapter. So um, excited to hear what questions you all have uh, as this you know, may influence some of the topics that we address in that chapter as well um, as we're developing that. So you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So in the next uh, you know, 10, 15 minutes or so, I'll talk about why climate change is a public health priority uh, with some specific context on the climate impacts on health in the Southeast and Florida, actions that can be taken to prepare for and respond to the impacts of climate change, and then some CDC resources that are available. Next slide. So as we know, climate change is causing more frequent and intense extreme weather events, such as heat waves, hurricanes, drought, and wildfires. And this is impacting our health from direct impacts through heat-related illness and death, injury, mental health stress, uh, to the indirect impacts, such as respiratory illnesses related to poor air quality from wildfire smoke and earlier and longer pollen seasons, uh, as well as the spread of diseases from ticks and mosquitoes as their seasons and geographic distribution are expanding. Um, so just to name a few examples. For this reason, climate change is a public health priority as its current and future impacts can undo years of public health progress. That is why the Climate and Health Program, which was established by Congress in 2009, aims to serve as a leader for preparing public health for the effects of climate change. So I'll now go over a few specific examples of what we're seeing and expect to see in the Southeast. Next slide. So heat, heat causes the most weather-related deaths in the US than all other weather-related disasters combined, which may be a surprise to some of you. In the Southeast, we're seeing increases in nighttime temperatures, which are important for cooling people and the environment in the summer months. Cities in particular are experiencing the worsening heat due to a combination of the warmer temperatures and the urban heat island effect, which is the phenomenon in which cities do not cool as much uh, compared to rural counterparts, as the nighttime, um, it's particularly at night because of concrete in, from roads and buildings, hold that heat longer. So you'll see um, this uh, image uh, or map is from the fourth National Climate Assessment, and it's really showing how the Southeast is experiencing a dramatic increase in those nighttime temperatures, and, and that's really important and dangerous for health. Next slide. Additionally, climate change is expected to worsen air quality as we're seeing more frequent and intense wildfires which cause smoke, uh, longer and more intense pollen seasons, and more frequent and intense high smog days, all of which can exacerbate asthma and respiratory illness. Um, the chart on the right is demonstrating that change that we've seen in the pollen season in Atlanta, though this is being seen across the country. Uh, that with increases um, or with climate change, we're seeing increases in pollen uh, for uh, both the spring tree season and the fall weed season. Uh, we're also seeing a shift in the pollen season to starting earlier as the winters are shorter. Next slide. So climate change is causing more frequent and intense rain events uh, in the Southeast from hurricanes uh, and tropical storms causing flooding events that we would expect to occur only once in 100 years or 500 years are happening much more frequently. Uh, this has impacts on people directly with injury and damage to property, but it also has damage, causes damage to critical infrastructures such as roads and hospitals, which are all important for delivering those essential healthcare services. Um, and this map on the right is actually identifying hospitals that fall within that 100 and 500 year floodplain on the Georgia coast, uh, though similar maps um, exist for these uh, in Florida as well and all across the country. And, and we're seeing, you know, critical hospital infrastructure are in these flood zones. So during these events are really going to have a hard time uh, serving their constituents, their, their jurisdictions um, uh, during, during these extreme weather events. Next slide. 
So with those shorter winters and longer summers, we're also seeing that the season for ticks and mosquitoes are getting longer and the geographic distribution is expanding. So the areas and seasons for ticks and mosquitoes are growing, increasing the risk of what we call vector-borne diseases, uh, which are diseases carried by ticks and mosquitoes, uh, such as West Nile virus and Zika. This is of particular concern to the Southeast in Florida where the Aedes aegypti mosquito, uh, which carries Zika, chikungunya, and dengue, already exist uh, and is expected to, as you can see on the map on the right, is expected to expand into other regions across the Southeast and, and outside of that in the US. Next slide. So how climate change impacts someone is not only determined by where you are, but who you are. And there are certain populations that are disproportionately impacted by climate. Uh, we call these frontline communities as they're feeling the impacts first and worst. In the Southeast, these include, but are not limited to workers, particularly in agriculture, forestry, hunting, fishing, and construction sectors, as those are uh, areas of, um, or, you know, where people are working outside and are most vulnerable to heat-related deaths, uh, representing almost 68% of heat-related deaths nationally are all found in the Southeast. So the map on the right is actually demonstrating uh, the projected um, change in safe outdoor working hours with a decrease of more than 5% by 2090 in parts of Florida. Next slide. So I'll briefly go over uh, what can we do about this. I know I'm, I maybe have about five or uh, so minutes. Um, so go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, the CDC's Climate Health Program developed a five-step uh, building resilience against climate effects uh, called the BRACE framework. And it identifies uh, likely climate impacts to communities, potential health effects associated with those impacts uh, the most at-risk populations and locations, and then moving into um, developing adaptation plans and the evaluation of the impact of those plans so that we can continually improve uh, our actions and improve the health of uh, people in our communities. Next slide. So the Climate Health Program funds states, cities, tribes, and territories to implement this framework. Uh, so they can address gaps in critical public health functions and services. And these are grant recipients um, funded over the past 12 years. You'll see that Florida has been a funded recipient. Next slide. So what are some examples of actions that can be taken by communities? Uh, you've heard all the bad stuff. What can we do about it? So for extreme heat, communities can, and these are just a few examples, but uh, they can develop a heat response plan by um, expanding the extreme heat alert system and ensuring vulnerable populations can be reached, establishing air conditioned space available to the public known as a cooling center, increasing tree canopy to keep buildings and surrounding areas cooler, and the use of cool paving and reflective porous materials to lower surrounding temperatures. So um, for mental health concerns, communities can prepare an emergency plan, develop behavioral health plans for disasters, which include clear messaging about ways to access mental health services and crisis counseling. Uh, for air pollution, communities can encourage active and mass transportation, such as walking, biking, and shared transportation, which lowers traffic-related pollution, as well as reducing energy waste by weatherizing homes, offices, schools, and other buildings, and encouraging uh, purchase of fuel-efficient vehicles and equipment. And then finally, for storms and flooding, uh, communities can prepare infrastructure by identifying buildings, roads, uh, and other critical infrastructure that are most vulnerable to damage, uh, and ensure that existing and new infrastructure can withstand the increasingly intense storms and flooding. And then finally, imp improve sanitation and water management to protect drinking water sources and delivery systems uh, to prevent sanitary sewer overflows, which is of particular concern to Florida. Next slide. So here's an example of one of the actions taken by Florida as part of the Climate Ready States and Cities Initiative. Uh, climate change causes sea level rise and more intense hurricanes. 
uh, due to the warming waters. And these changes are making homes in Florida more prone to flooding and increasing the need and use of emergency shelters. So the Florida Department of Health conducted an evaluation of emergency shelter use and whether they were sufficiently serving uh, individuals with disabilities um, and identified vulnerable population. And this evaluation has led to a collaboration with FEMA and the Red Cross and changes that implemented, uh, implemented in the operation and communication of emergency shelters. So to ensure more equitable access to shelter services. And this is just one example of, um, of one of their actions that were taken as a grant recipient. Next slide. So I'll briefly mention, uh, so there's some time for Q&A, that um, all of our tools and resources for enhancing public health preparedness in response to climate change are available on our website. And these include trainings, guidance documents, data, and social media toolkits, among other things I'm probably not thinking of, uh, but uh, all publicly available and on our website at that link at the top of the slide. So next slide. And with that, I'll say thank you and uh, happy to take questions if we have time. The question is, um, I've read about how insect populations have declined dramatically across the world. Is this also true for mosquitoes? Uh, so what the projections are showing is that mosquito distribution is actually going to grow. So in geographic distribution, as far as load or number of mosquitoes, I, I'm not sure on that. Uh, I would, refer to those studies. Um, so I don't I don't have that information off the top of my head, but uh, in general, we are seeing, uh, you know, an increase in these vector borne diseases because of the shift in the in the mosquito and tick uh, season, um, which uh, is, of course, you know, of concern for public health. Okay, I have a few more coming in. So um, what temperature triggers a heat emergency? Does this vary by region? That's a great question. It does. So um, of course, if, if you all remember, the Pacific Northwest had a major heat event uh, last year, and it was a day that, it was several days that were in the 90s. So, you know, for us in the Southeast, that's our full summer, that's three months uh, of weather, that's not a big deal. But um, for the Pacific Northwest that had major public health implications and lots of deaths because people were not equipped with uh, air conditioning. So um, it we are very much adapted to temperature based on not only our bodies and what we can uh, handle uh, personally, but also you know what infrastructure do we have to um, to cool our ourselves in our homes and our offices. Uh, so there is a lot of variation and there's not a consistent um, heat threshold that's set nationally, though they, they are working on that. Uh, there are some regional, so that varies region to region and state by state as to when that uh, heat um, threshold is met. Okay, a few more questions. Um, so is uh, septic to sewer conversion an important component to healthy adaptation for, for preventing water-borne public health issues? Uh, septic to sewer, um, I, I believe so. I mean, anything that we're often looking at uh, sewer systems and their resiliency to um, flooding, that's a, a major concern because Often we'll see either saltwater intrusion or sewer intrusion into drinking water during flooding events if they are um, susceptible. So, uh, you know, being able to control those systems and have better eyes on them, uh, it being, you know, part of the government sewer um, system, I imagine that that would uh, increase um, reaction and, and knowledge around whether uh, we know these are being, um, are resilient and uh, so yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Okay. I have a few more minutes. Um, 
do you think that planting more trees in our cities is a real solution to heat health risk? Uh, yes, we, we do know that um, urban, you know, tree canopy cover uh, reduces temperature dramatically, especially in cities um, and in areas. And we know also that communities uh, that are disadvantaged tend to not have tree cover. Uh, and so there's a lot of, there's a big equity issue around that, that um, these regions of, the, of cities that are of people that are disproportionately impacted by climate change and by heat are also um, particularly vulnerable. They don't tend to have as, uh, their houses aren't as weatherized. They don't have um, air conditioning possibly or ability to pay for air conditioning, uh, which is of particular concern in the Southeast. Uh, so, you know, having these passive cooling mechanisms in place, I think are, is, is important. Uh, I see a one minute warning. Do I have time for one more question? One more, okay. Um, let's see, it's hard to read uh, at the same time. So, um, Okay, so Southwest Florida seems mostly focused on hurricanes rather than heat. Uh, any advice for us on uh, heat preparation? I think um, that yes, hurricanes gets a lot of attention. Uh, you know, it has a lot of property damages and, and um, economic damages uh, as well as health damages. Though we do know that heat has uh, a disproportionate effect on health. Um, and, you know, a, a big, a uh, vulnerable population is elderly living alone. So I think targeting those, and especially in Florida, there isn't a large aging population. I think um, prioritizing that and focusing on that is, uh, you know, an important way to look at the issue um, and reaching out to those communities and making sure that they have a plan or a way to get cool uh, in these extreme heat events is important and, and one way to address the issue. <laughs> 